ref refreshed or stressed? <laughs> that sounds like a good one. I want to hear this one. <laughs> refreshed or stressed? I know that a whole bunch of people know what it means to be stressed. And uh, there's a lot of stressors that you've endured through this, through this season. And, uh, and you're looking at, and if you're watching the news, you might be doing good all day long. All day long, you're just having a good time. You're praising the Lord. You're worshiping God. You get home, you watch the news, and by the time you get through with just 15 minutes of the news, well, now you're stressed. You never knew there was all kinds of stuff going south in this world. I mean, with wars, and they're, they're saying, well, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and the economy, and interest rates, and, and you know, supply chains, and, and everything else that's going on worldwide. And then in your own world, things that are happening to you, thinking that, I don't know if we're ever going to see tomorrow. That's stress. And on top of that, the enemy's attacking you and your relationships. I promise you, you're not the only one. If you think you're the only one that you're having some issues with spouses or with children or grandchildren, I want you to be encouraged that you are not all by yourself. Say amen. Okay, thank you. I need you to believe to continue to, to understand that as we present the issue, and this is this is what I like to do. This is what how God gives it to me. We're, we're engaged with situations and circumstances that we're going through in the fire, in the storms. And then we put it to prayer. God, show us what we need to do. Give us direction. Give us insight. And you pray specific prayers. God begins to give you specific answers. I know you're stressed. In fact, some of you, you came in and you were doing, I was, you know, shaking hands and, and, uh, uh, looking at everything that's going on, and some of you came in and you was excited about who you are in Christ and what Jesus is doing. And I ask you, how are you doing today? And and I I think we ought to quit doing that. I think we should quit doing how you're doing today because here's what it is: it causes people to lie in the house of God. <laughs> some of you looking at me like like. Uh, busted. <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> well, according to you, I'm doing okay, I guess. But, uh, but if I was to really be honest, there's some stuff that might not be as good as maybe I'm letting on. Because in all of our lives, there are stressors. People are drained. And this is what I see. People are wore out. They're tired. They're spent. Man, hanging out with all kinds of different people, from church people to people that, um, and uh, and one thing that is happening in our our city is, like every other city, we're growing and and there is, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but it, uh, and I I know some of you really don't like Walmart. Walmart is a good place to have put your finger on the barometer of what's taking place in our community because that if there would be a central square that that would be it and some of you avoid that place like the plague but it is also a place I mean you can get anything and everything in one place now I, I, I shop at city market because we have city market people here for food because I enjoy the food there but you can't buy underwear at city market <laughs> anyway some say, well, maybe. Okay. So Walmart, patience is at an all-time low. Just driving to Walmart, you see there are people that patience is at an all-time low. You might be one of them driving to Walmart that you have zero patience of getting to that place. And then once you get to that place, how many of you realize, man, you got to park not in the first or second tier, but you're in the third and even the fourth tier of the parking because that's the closest you can get. 
And when you get into the, that store, and this like any other place where you go into the market and go shopping, whether it is a restaurant or whether it is at the gas station, this is what I see and this is what I feel, that there are people that stress levels and they're wore out and they're tired and they have zero patience. Uh, used to be I could strike up a conversation, but now I'm talking to somebody and talking to that individual, I make eye contact and I'm talking to them and they don't say anything and they just turn and that's okay a lot of times, but this was a store employee and so they're supposed to try. <laughs> and I see that, yeah, and the Lord just quickened me. People are wore out. People are tired. People are stressed because there's no joy. All they have is despair because there is no hope in the future. They have no insight. They have no direction. We've seen this in Nehemiah chapter 8, if you turn there with me. Let's, let's look at this. and So you can, you can understand, the, we are not the only people that have ever gone through hard times or difficult times, stressful times, and, and, what, and what the direction is, what God has given to us in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. And we're going to pick it up verse 9, if you would, verse 9. Nehemiah 8, verse 9. And Nehemiah, this is verse 9, chapter 8, the book is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra was the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn, do not weep, because all the people were weeping when they had heard the words of the law. Now let me give you a little bit of backstory of what's going on. You see, they had gone on their way in life and living and did not know that they had separated themselves from God because God had given them the word. God had given them the road map on how to live under blessing, how to live under provision, how to live under the grace that God had given to them. A lot of people look at the word of God and say, well, that's just a, a book of a bunch of do's and don'ts. You know what that word is, that book in front of you? You know what that? It is not the regulations to kill your joy. What it is is a book that gives you the roadmap, gives you the direction so you can live under great grace, under provision, under joy, under happiness, and all that God has for you. That is what the book is about. How many to know that? It shows you how you can receive all the promises that he has for you. And when they finally realized that, they were broken. For they had known that they were on the outside of that provision. That they were far from the provision of grace and, and what God had given to them. And so they begin to weep. They begin to understand and that, that they not only had turned away from their help and their hope, but now they seen how to get back there and they were broken. So Nehemiah said, go your way. Eat the fat, drink the sweet, send the portions to those for whom nothing is prepared for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. They were going through a very difficult season. What they had realized is they were entering into the festival of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of feasts. And they were instructed from Moses on down during this season that you need to make yourself this tabernacle, this little hut on the outside of your dwelling place. You need to dwell in that place. And while you're there, you need to have some introspection 
see where you are at and begin to have thanksgiving to give God the praise and the adoration that he deserves because that was a reminder of the deliverance that God had given to the children of Israel as he brought them out of Egypt. And this very specific festival, they knew that they had not, not only forgotten, had not followed it, but they were on the outside of what God wanted to do. And this is why he's saying, I want you to go, and I want you to remember this festival. I want you to remember these things. And to those that have not prepared, I want you to give to them so everyone can be in this place. Because it's the joy of the Lord. He didn't say, your joy. And this is where a lot of people misinterpret this Bible. The joy. He didn't say, your joy is your strength. He said, the joy of the Lord. What makes God happy? That, that's a great question. What makes God happy? David, David had this question, if I give to him a thousand rams, 10,000 bushels, will that satisfy? I, I mean, you know, everything in this world, the world and everything in it is his. Have you ever given somebody a, a gift of something that was already theirs? You just went into the garage and found something and wrapped it up because you didn't think they remembered and gave it to them in surprise? <laughs> Some of you thinking, that's a good idea. I'm going to remember that one. Okay. I'm going to dig through boxes and stuff that they don't even know they have it. They haven't looked at that for you. Hey, this looks familiar. Yeah. Happy birthday. If we give to him something that's already his, is that going to... No, there's only one thing that you have that is going to bring grace, the praise and the adoration and the glory coming from your heart, the worship. Someone say worship. That's the only thing that I have that's going to please him. It's the only thing that he desires from me is to worship him, to praise him, to give him glory. Now, that's my strength. That is my provision. That's my hope. Our joy, your joy, is dependent on what you do in relationship to your God. The joy that God would give to you. You know, you, you, you don't have joy because everything's perfect. And a lot of folks are looking at this. You say, well, when my life finally gets in order, when I finally get all my bills paid, when I finally get done with this sickness, when I finally get all my kids in line and they're all serving God, when the dog finally goes and gets the ball that I've thrown, when everything is perfect, then I'll be happy. And if you're waiting for everything to be perfect in your life before joy shows up, you're going to be sadly disappointed because your joy will never be housed in this perfect world because this world will never be perfect. You might be thinking that there is something in this world that is stealing your joy. Something that is taking place in situations, circumstances of your life that, hey, uh, I was happy until that happened. I was happy until... I got this job or lost this job. I was happy until I got married. I was happy until I had this kid. I was, I was happy until I went to church. <laughs> now I'm kind of stressed because he's pointing out all these things and it's messing me up. I was happy. And you can fill in the blank. Whatever is causing you a little bit of stress. If, listen to me now. If there is something in this world that can steal your joy, you don't have the right joy. Your joy is housed in the temporal. 
Your joy is fixed in the physical realm. And that joy will be fleeting. It'll come like a roller coaster of emotions. You'll feel happy, and then all of a sudden, something takes place, and you've lost your joy. Your joy can never be housed in finances, in possessions, even in people. When your joy is affixed and attached to something that's tangible, then it will not last. Now, if I was to ask you this question, do you want to be happy? Duh. Yes, I want to be happy. Let me ask you this question. How many of you are happy? Yeah, 50%. Turn to that person next to you and say, are you happy? Okay? Now, tell them this. It's important to tell your face you're happy. (laughs) Psalms chapter 30, verse 5. His anger is for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping situations might come, but it's always temporary. Joy is eternal. So the next question I need to ask you is how to find joy in the midst of the storm, because some of you right now, there is a stressor in your life, and there is Situations, circumstances, you feel that you're overwhelmed. And because you're stressed, you're wondering, how am I ever going to find that place where I can be refreshed? Now, here's first and foremost, and I'm going to give this to you today because I know that where God is taking us, it's going to require you to walk in the joy of the Lord, that strength and that provision that God gives to you. The reason why it's important for you to do that, not only do you maintain your own sanity, because your ministry is very dependent on how you present the gospel. If you've ever had somebody come up to you and say, I would like to know more about your God because I see the joy inside of you, you're on the right track. You're in the right road. When somebody comes and asks you, would you tell me more about your Jesus because I see something different about you. If you're not able to do that, then this morning with me, we say we need more joy. We need more of the presence of God living in us that shines through us so that people can look at us and see God doing what he does. They'll watch you and they'll see you going through some really rough times and they'll see how you maintain that provision of testimony because anybody can tell somebody Jesus is really good when things are really good. But where your testimony is so powerful and life-changing is when you're walking through the valley of the shadow and they see that your countenance has not changed. They see your demeanor is still strong that there is a presence of the Holy Spirit that walks with you. In fact, I would be willing to say this. In the depths of the darkness, your testimony is greater than on the mountaintop of light. Your testimony is more powerful when you're walking through the sorrow and through the pain and through the sickness if they see Jesus. If we are living in the end days, if we're about ready to walk into what Jesus calls that great and terrible day of the Lord, and if Jesus' prophecies in Matthew chapter 4 are coming to pass, then the days and the times are only going to become dark 
and even more, there is stress and there are things that are happening and it's going to increase in the end days. If we are there, you're going to need a greater anointing. You're going to need a greater provision. You're going to need more help to get through the days that you're living in. And that has got to be more than just a hope. Uh, some people saying, well, it's got to get better. <laughs> and you're right. I mean, no, it's going to get better. It really is. It's going to get better. It's called the millennial reign of Christ. <laughs> I can't wait. But in the meantime, God's got this. And I know I'm painting this picture. I know I'm painting this picture, and this is kind of a heavy service to begin with. And I know things are happening, and you're, you're saying, Pastor, I came to church because I was stressed out, and I needed some encouragement, and you're not helping. Hang on. We're getting there. i got to let you know where you're at right now because this is... And, and I, I know a lot of people, what they do, they fa they're faced with situations, circumstance. They just, they try because they're eternal optimists. And I pray that God gives you that ability to be an eternal optimist. No matter what happens, you're always able to see the good. How many like people like that? How many are people like that? You can always see good no matter what's happening. Wave your hand because there's people looking for you. Hang out with those. They just raise their hand there. They always see the good. God helps them see the good. Hang out with them people because they'll rub off. And I'm not even going to talk about the eternal pessimists because uh, we're going to help you. <clears throat> it's going to be good. Now, this is where we're housed and this is what's happening. Now, here is the help. This is why you came. This is why you're in the house. We need times of refreshing. We need those moments where God gives us strength and encouragement, where God brings healing and hope and renews the mind because we're pressed in, we're weighted down, and we need a little bit of hope. We need somebody just to speak some life into the situation that we don't see a way out. And that's why you've come. So I'm going to ask you a question. From what well are you drinking? What well? And when I say well, I'm referring to that well in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of the water from this water, and he was referring to a well that she had come. This is, this is the story that Jesus was in the afternoon asking this woman who was by herself, would you draw some water for me from this well? And, and, and she didn't really understand what was that divine appointment that was about ready to happen. And he said, if you, whoever drinks from this water, we're going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, they will never thirst again. The water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the well I need to be drinking from. That's the well that God has provided. A well that starts inside of me that gives me life. Not just eternal life, but life more abundant. Jesus said, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you would have life and life more abundantly. That is the life that is provided for you today. That is the life that Jesus has given to you. From that well, you've got to determine, I'm going to drink from the water, from the well of my Lord and Savior. 
Now, this water was spoken of throughout the, the Old Testament. Ezekiel talked about this water. He said it's a river, and this river is flowing right out of the throne room of God. And this river of life that is flowing right now is flowing to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that this morning? Say amen. That this river of God is flowing to you, not just by you, but exactly and straight to you. It is not something that is for someone else. This river is for everyone who has named Jesus as their Savior, who has asked Jesus to come into my life. This river is for all who are thirsty, all who are weary, all who are wore out. This is the river that I'm talking about, and that's the water that I need to be drinking from. You see, if I'm drinking from the well, from this world, this well, and it might seem good at a moment, it might seem okay, it might have a temporary hope, it might have a temporary uh, a fix that's going to carry me through tomorrow, I will always be thirsty again. It will never satisfy. It will always leave me wanting. But this river of God, if it comes to you, he said you'll never thirst again. And I want to encourage you this morning. I want to help you again this morning because I know that many of you have been to the well, that have been to the well that Jesus provides. Many of you have been there, and you're there even now. But some of you, it's been a while. Some of you, you're just wore out. You're tired. You're overwhelmed. You're spent. And you're saying, I need that refreshing. I need someone to come to me and help me again because I don't think that in this season that I'm dwelling, in this life that I'm living, I'm not going to make it much further. Why do you think that the, one of the highest suicide rates that have ever been recorded has taken place this last couple of years. This last couple of years, even in our county, the suicide rate is up. Is because people have no hope. The thing that they were hoping in, the thing that they were looking to is gone. And in a moment, that leaves them with nothing else to live for. Do you know you have the answer? Do you know that you hold life and you give them purpose and you give them a tomorrow? You have that in your hands. Ah, oh, Lord, let this river that is flowing to me flow through me. There are so many that need this hope. There are so many that need this help. But you can't give something you don't have. You can't lead where you won't go and you can't teach what you don't know. You've got to be able to have what God has given to be able to release and to bless. Now, there are so many people that have been hanging out at different fountains, at different wells. One of those is social media. I know. And we're talking social media. Stay away, preacher. Let me help you out. Because there's a lot of great things that happen and take place on social media. Nobody said amen, but really there is. Now this might be for the younger generation. And somebody was talking to me this morning and said, you know, you know, I really had no clue of get, how to get this information. And this, this uh, five-year-old grabbed her tablet and bidi 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 bidi, here it is. <laughs> That's this generation. And there's, like I said, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of provision. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of help. But did you know that there are so many people that are gripped with social media in the, in the, because it, it brings a standard of competition and conformity? And, and here's what I mean by that. Their life is judged by everybody else's life. They look at something because, oh, somebody did this. And, and, I, and you can get caught up in that. Somebody is always posting that they, you know, they're going on these trips. You know, they're going on, the, you know, they're, 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 uh, and they, they post all these pictures of the wonderful food that they're eating. And they're, they're you know, these posting these pictures by, they're in the Caribbean, you know, and they're, uh, they're, they're at the seashore, you know, on the sandy beach, the white sandy beach. And, you know, they're eating lobster and, and they're showing these pictures. And, and you're thinking to yourself, my life stinks. I don't eat lobster. Best thing I've done is a McDonald's fish of filet sandwich. And, and I'm not on a sandy beach. 
All I got is gravel, driveway. My life stinks. And, and they begin to judge their own life according to everybody else's that is posting. What they post, you know, people, well, we just got this new outfit. And they, 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 they post themselves this picture of how they, and, and you're thinking, I need an outfit. Or, Chris, they post a brand new fishing roll. You know, this fishing, this fishing pole, this fishing rod, and it's, and it looks like it's, you know, that was David, and he posted that, and you're thinking, I need that. Where did David get that? Or, you know, this, I'll, I'll mess with everyone if you want me to. A uh, brand new golf club. Ooh, stay away from that one. A brand new vehicle. Hey, God's blessing them. I don't get blessed. I'm driving this old jalopy that's breaking down. And so we judge our life by what is the standard that everyone else is put. And I'll promise you, you know, they post the highlights. You know what would help? If we all start posting the breakdown, the blow up. Here I am sitting in my shorts and flip flops and my roof's leaking right into my grilled cheese sandwich. Life is not so great. And you're thinking, well, man, at least my roof's not leaking on my sandwich. The conformity that is demanded is at it all. And that's why, especially the young people, they try to affix their life and they try to live up to something that will never happen. Everyone is your own individual. God made you for who you are, how you are. And do you know you're perfect in his eyes? He did not say, you know, if you would just lose 30 pounds, I'd love you. He did not say if you get rid of the warts and you get rid of the wrinkles and you get rid of the gray hair, then maybe I'd, I'd love you. I'm not looking at anybody because this is a reflection. You know what he did say? You're the apple of my eye. You're my beloved. Yeah, just like you are. In all your imperfections. In all your faults and all your failures. That he loves you. And he created you. It don't matter if nobody else sees. It doesn't matter if anybody else can understand it. He loves you. And that is the beginning of understanding joy. That's the first step in understanding God's heart and God's favor on you. Not to emphasize or accentuate the lack, what you don't have, where you're not, but what you do have in him, who you are in Christ. Beloved. Child of the living God, sons and daughters of God. Isn't that awesome? Some would say, well, maybe he'd love me more if. No, he can't love you any more than he does. His love is not contingent. His love is not temporary. His love is not fickle. His love is his love. And you might be saying, well, you know, I've disappointed God because I didn't do. I should have done. I disappointed him. You can't disappoint that God. You can't disappoint the one that already knew before he created you, you was going to mess it up. You messed it up, he still loves you. 
I know that sounds strange because our love is temporary. Our love is affixed on an emotion and on situational circumstances, but His love is not. He loves you in spite of you, what you can or you cannot do. Now, that being said, He loves you so much, He's not going to leave you like you are. He's not going to leave you in the mess. He's not going to leave you in the hurt and the pain. He's not going to leave you in the problem, and He's going to make a way. We are changed and being conformed into His image. That's what the Word says. And He is working on us every day, every moment of the day, drawing us to that place where we have relationship and we're closer to Him. And all the rough, how many of you got some rough spots, some rough edges? You got, okay, and He's, he's working on those, and he's like the potter, He takes the lump of clay and He puts you on the wheel. And he starts forming. He starts doing what the potter does, and he, he, and and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's a rock, there's a stick, there's a, a lump of straw or something in there, and then he stops it, and he he pulls that rock out, he pulls that stick out, and then he, and we go again, and then and then he starts making you into the the image. He makes you into that vessel, and he, he's making you into something beautiful, and and then and then and then as it continues to be. Uh, formed and and being uh, and and all that takes place before you're put into the fire, and then you go through the fire. Someone say thank you, Jesus, for the fire. Mm. And you go through the fire because the fire is what causes you to be made into the type of vessel that now He can use. And all the while, he knows exactly what he's doing in your life. And that's the second step. Not only know of his love, but accepting who you are in him. Quit trying to be something you're not. God gives you vision. God gives you direction. He shows you what is going to happen, and we strive for that. You know, I just realized a couple years ago that even though Tom Brady is still playing quarterback, perhaps I ought to let that dream go. <laughs> I'm messing with you now, okay? <clears throat> you know what I'm saying. Oh, okay, you know, you know, Tiger Wood is probably going to leave the PGA, and there's room for us, Larry. We might as well sign up, right? Now that that one's gone too. Too old to be an astronaut. You know, there's things that God has called us, and He has designed us. And once we accept what he has done and what he is doing, what he has for us right now, you can live in the regrets of yesterday, the could have, the should have, the would have. Maybe if I would have done this, then I could be doing this. No, God has something for you right now. Right now, there's plans and there's purposes. Right now, God has something great for you. Even in this season of your life, whether you're just beginning or whether you're on the end of life, whether you just have a few more years left and He's going to call you home, no matter where you're at in this journey, God has something for you right now. God has provision for you right now. Let Him speak over you. Then begin to believe what he says. Because if your joy is in the Lord, Satan can't touch it. Now, second thing is, and we're going to jump through this. Only got a few things left. Someone say amen. Times of renewal. This is how you hang on to the joy. This is how you hang on to the passion. This is how you hang on to the purpose, and it doesn't overwhelm you. Because Satan will use, 
I'm going to hit a couple of you right in between the running lights, and I, I, I know this is, might be difficult for a couple of you, but don't turn this one off, okay? Don't switch the channel. This is not a commercial. This is some meat. For a couple people, it's going to be hard. But if you'll receive it, it'll be life-changing, okay? I'll preface, preface this like that. There are things in your life that derail you. Every single one of us, there is something that causes a problem. You're doing good, and that one thing happens. And all of a sudden, you go from joy to hurt and disappointment, angry and frustrated. You go from God is blessing me, and I am moving in my anointing, to the place of pain and frustration, anger. That one thing I'm talking about. Satan will continue to use that one thing until you give it to Jesus. Satan will continue to manipulate and cause pain and frustration, steal your joy, cause the hurt to be renewed, derail you. He will continue to manipulate that hot topic button. He will press as hard and as long as he can until you give it to Jesus. You know, some people say, well, I just need to get over it. I just need to get past it. Some would say, you know, I've given it to Jesus. I did that years ago. You know how often you need to give something to the Lord? Every time it bothers you. And if it is something that is manipulating your joy and something that is causing you pain and frustration, then that is something that is still active and needs to be given over to the Lord. And we're going to go through that process and give you some insight on how to do that. And today, today, some of you are going to walk out victorious. Some of you are going to lay it down at the foot of the cross and you're going to walk out of this place changed and Satan is no longer going to able to use that one thing no more because I'm going to give you the authority and the tools from the Word of God and the insight and the Holy Spirit that when that happens, it will no longer be a manipulation. This takes place Times of renewal. Matthew chapter 11, look at this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. That weight, that burden, that area, that arena that causes, causes you to be frustrated, causes you to lose it, you take it to Jesus. Do you know if you was to see in the spiritual realm that that one thing is like a yoke around your neck? It's like a fetter. It's like a chain. And Satan has that chain. And all he has to do is just pull on it. And he pulls on that chain, and it will manipulate you. I'm doing really good. I'm going on for Jesus. Things are going well. I'm ministering the gospel. People around me are being encouraged. And that one thing, Satan's got a hold of it, and he just jerks it, and it pulls you back. You're leaning in to Jesus. You're pressing in and seeing God do what he said he's going to do. But Satan's got that hook. Satan's got that chain. And all he has to do is just pull it. Ugh. Jesus said, come to me, those that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. 
the first step in this provision of being released and walking in freedom is say, Jesus, I come to you with this weight. I come to you with this burden. And I give it to you. You've got to recognize it before you can release it. If you're not willing to understand that there is an issue, that there's a problem, and you're just going to shove it off to the side and say, I can, and I'm going to deal with this later. And, and there's another insight. That one thing is not a person. Don't buy into the lie of the enemy. I said it's not a person that is causing you frustration. Who's behind it? The manipulator. The father of lies. The one that is using that situation. Because here's what I know. You can get rid of that person. You can get them out of your life. And say, phew, finally got some freedom. And guess what? The next one that comes along is going to have that same demonic manipulation. It's going to have the same darkness, the same thing that's going to tug at you. And you're going to think, wow, does everybody in the world have this problem? I'm the only one that has it right. When I recognize and I realize I need his help in this area, I'll give it to him. Lord, help me has got to be the prayer, not Lord, help everyone else. I come to him with my burden. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but y'all better say amen or I'll run around this block three or four more times. The Holy Spirit just released that. And I don't know who it's to. I'm not preaching to anyone in particular, but I know he's speaking to you. I know he's helping you. Because all of us, all of us, and there's not a one in here that doesn't have something that the enemy manipulates and uses. And it might be a family member, but it's not that family member. Satan is using that family member. It's not that co-worker. That co-worker can come and go. And that manipulation will always be there because Satan knows how to eat your lunch. I like my lunch. I don't want Satan to eat. I want to quit eating my lunch. Man, I, I prepared this lunch. Are you ready? Number one, cast your care. Casting your cares. And that's in First Peter 5, 7. He said, cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. That is the beginning. I'm going to give him this issue. I'm going to give him this problem. He didn't say give it to anyone else. You give it to Jesus. And that's the first step. I give it to the Lord. How often do you need to do that? As often as the enemy is using that against you, you give it to the Lord. It might be once a day. It might be a thousand times in a day. But you walk through it and say, okay, Jesus, I need your help in this area. I give it to you. Lord, I give to you this, this hurt. I give to you this frustration. I give to you the, the pain and the problem because it's stressing me. And when you release that to him, the... The next thing is that you begin to understand that his help is coming to you. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me and be blessed. So the yoke that you take and the, lo the yoke that you place upon yourself. And I'm going to I know I know we're going a little late, but you got to you got to hear this and receive it. That yoke is forgiveness. That yoke is mercy. That yoke is kindness. That yoke of blessing is, is what you are willing to release. Satan would like you to live in the town. He would like you to live in the village of the victim. He wants you to have this victim mentality that the world is against you. And you're all by yourself in this pain and this problem. He would like you to have this understanding that, man, my life really stinks. And everybody really doesn't understand the hurt and the pain and the problem. And if you dwell in that village, you will die in that village. You'll die in the despondency and the despair all alone. I choose to walk in the freedom and the overcoming grace of my Lord and Savior. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life under this housed manipulation of the demonic. 
I know who I am. I'm a child of the living God. I know I'm purposed. I know I'm blessed. I know I dwell in the authority of the Holy Spirit. That's His promise. That's not just something we're saying. That is what we live. That's what we walk. That's what we breathe. Because my life is going to count for something. And on that day, I'm going to hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. I'm going to hear those words, not because I feel that, oh, I'm oppressed. I'm depressed. I've walked through those valleys, I've walked through those situations, and I'm not going to sit down in those valleys. I'm going to continue to press on. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to do what God's called me to do, whether anybody else does it or not. And I'm giving you that because I live that. I walk that. It's not I'm guessing this is where we are. I'm going to do what God's called me to do the best of my ability. Do I make mistakes? All the time. Do I struggle? Yes. Is it, is it one day there's blessing the next day as I should have stayed in bed? Yes. All those things. But I choose to release the weight of all the nonsense of everything Satan throws at me. I choose to release that to him with an open hand. I'm not going to hang on to it. I'm not going to let it frustrate. I'm not going to let it control me. I'm not going to let it dictate to me. I'm going to take his yoke. Mercy. Grace. Forgiveness. Of hope. Of help. Of healing. And I'm going to give to him those chains that Satan used to have on me. And I don't know about you, but I have anticipation about the days ahead. Some people, all they talk to you about is doom and gloom and despair. About all the circumstances, situations, there are all these hurricanes that are taking. I just got, and I, this, this is some this is really exciting news I had uh, uh, from our, our missionaries, home missionaries that go to the that go into these places that are hit by hurricanes, and they go and help people, and they real build their lives and their homes. Uh, Brian and Kelly Nelson, those of you that know Brian and Kelly, they sent me they they sent me a a picture about uh, this flooded house. This flooded house, and there was a big alligator in the house. And this is like the challenge of ministry. <laughs> they didn't look at it like, oh, this could be terrible. We're done. We're done. This is no fun no more. You know, we've got to deal with alligators now. No, it's just another challenge, uh, just another provision. God's going to use it for a greater grace, a greater testimony about what he's doing. Uh, and you pray for them. They're in the throes of it right now. They're in Florida, and they're headed out. They're in there in that place of ministry already. That's exciting. That's exci- and that's the purpose. That's the anointing. And when you're walking there, that is where you'll find your joy. And Satan cannot steal that joy. Would you stand? Blessed or stressed? I'm going to choose to walk in blessing. I'm going to choose to walk in the joy in His provision. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. A couple questions to ask you, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer this morning. This is going to be easy. Those of you that have been dealing with a lot of stress, and there's some stressors in your life that the enemy has been using, he's been jerking your chain, and it's causing a lot of hurt, a lot of frustration. And you're saying today, I want to be done with that. I'm going to walk in the blessing. I'm going to walk in the fullness. I'm going to walk in the grace. And I'm going to put on God's yoke. And I'm going to give him this other one. And I'm done. 
I'm done with the joy of the world and the joy of the Lord is upon me and I'm going to walk in that provision and that strength. If that's you, just step out from where you're at and meet me at this altar. We're going to stand together and we're going to pray a prayer together. If that's you, say, I am going to allow God to give to me the help and the hope that I need. I'm done with this stressful situations, these circumstances, and I'm just going to trust Jesus today. I'm going to ask you to come meet with meet with me here at an altar. And by walking this direction, you're leaving the stress and you're walking into the bless. I'm leaving the stress and I'm walking into the blessing. Thank you, Jesus. He's good. He's good. Mm. There's something that happens when we, we move physically. And, and that's why I ask you to do this. There's something that takes place because you're acting upon it. You're not just thinking it, you're not just going through a, a repetition of prayer, but you're acting upon it. I'm going to act upon it. And I'm going to do it. Now, is everything going to change in a heartbeat in a moment? For some of you, yeah. But some of you, this is the first step in the journey of walking in blessing. And you're going to have to engage in what God has given to us. Cast all your care upon him. Take his yoke. And give him yours. Those of that altar here with me, <clears throat> would you join me in this prayer? I know some of you pray very eloquently and very with authority and power, and you know exactly what to say, how to say. But there might be one here that might not know how to pray or what to pray. So that's why I lead you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for your word. You have spoken to me. Jesus, I'm asking that you would take this yoke. It's a weight. It's an anchor that's dragging me down. Satan has had his way in this area, but no more. Today, I give it to you. Today, Jesus, I release it. And I say in Jesus' name, take this yoke, take this weight, take this burden, take the frustration, take the anger, take the hurt. I give it to you. And in Jesus' name, I take your yoke of grace of forgiveness, of freedom, of healing, of joy, of freedom. In Jesus' name, I take your yoke. Now, Jesus, give to me a heart that can receive. Anoint my ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Open my heart to receive what God is giving to me. And in Jesus' name, change my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now give him praise. Will you do that? Amen. 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 Some would say, was well, that all? Is that all I have to do? Is that it? Man, if that's all I had to do, I'd have done that years ago. Like I said, it's the first step. Come on, it's the first step. Now, here's the great thing about it is you're finally on the right road, going in the right direction, taking the first step to Jesus. Here's what I know. that The stressors, the joy killers, stuff that's been ripping you off, you now give it to Jesus. It's that one thing. Come on, that one thing. You give it to him. Some of you saying, there's more than one. <laughs> okay, start with the one. You can give him the whole basket, okay? You can give him the whole truckload if you need to, but you start with the one thing, that one, that really one thing that you know if he took this, it would so much, so much more. You start with that, and you give it to him. Some of you are giving it to him again. Just like that, I said, I talked to you about the one thing, and now I could, I could tell there's some there that's weight. Give it to him again. Okay, Jesus, I give it to you again. Satan is going to come at you even before you get out the door and he's going to start messing with you. Give it to him again. 
You get in the parking lot, give it to him again. On your way home, give it to Jesus. Say, Jesus, you got to take this. Take it from me. And then press in. Now, with an open hand, you don't give it to Jesus and say, well, you know, if you don't do real well, I'm going to take it back. Mm -mm. No, you give it to him and let him have it. You release it with an open hand, with a trust. And that's the beginning of the journey. Is he going to rescue you? Yes. Is he going to heal you? Yes. Is he going to restore your joy? Yes. Is he going to restore family? Yes. Is he going to restore ministries? Yes. That's who he is. Are you willing to walk it? Come on. Not just an exercise. Oh, well, you know, pastor asked me to come do this, so I'm doing it. I hope it works. No, this is, it's, it's a journey and it's a commitment. And if you're willing to do that, then God's, he's with you. And he said, the joy, it's your strength. It's your joy. It's your provision. Now, prayer staff is already at the altar, most of them. And we're going to just pray for those that want prayer. If you, you, there's some weight upon you and you say, I just.